Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Wow, there's a lot of people coming into our Zoom. We're thrilled to see so many of you here today. Welcome to this series of Scandinavian Films webinars at Berlinale EFM 2021. Uh, we have three great talks lined up for you this week, uh, co-productions, youth films, and demystifying sales. Uh, these webinars are a great collaboration between the five Nordic Film Institutes. Um, I can also mention you can have meetings with them all week during the EFM. Uh, you can watch so many Scandinavian films uh, showing in the market uh, or in the festival. And if you want more information about any of that, go to scandinavianfilms.org. So today's session is all about joining forces, collaborating for strong co-productions. Uh, I should mention my name is Wendy Mitchell. I'm a film journalist and film festival consultant, and I've helped those five partners curate this series. We've got some amazing speakers lined up. Uh, this session is also a collaboration with you, the audience. So let's hear your questions at any time, not just at the end. Um, use that Q&A box uh, or button down below, and we'll get to the questions as they come up. Um, I know you're going to have some great questions. In fact, somebody, I should look up his name, Reham, already sent in some questions before the webinar even started, and they're really good. So happy to answer questions. Today, we're going to have five great speakers. I'm actually going to introduce them one by one. Makes it very dramatic, doesn't it? <clears throat> Excuse me. We're going to start uh, by bringing on Lizalot Forsman, who is CEO of the Nordisk Film and TV Fund. Um, she is Finnish. There we have Lizalot. Welcome. Um, now, Lizalot, we could let you talk for this whole hour about Nordic co-productions because there's so much to know and you're at the very center of it all at the fund. Um, but can you give us a little bit of an overview about how the Nordics co-produce with each other? We know that so many projects are co-productions amongst the Nordic countries, but then how often do they also co-produce with other countries? Uh, so uh, for our fund, first, thanks thanks for inviting us. And it's, it's always a joy to get these questions that broaden the Nordic view outside of the Nordics, because as you said, we do co-produce a lot inside the Nordics. And, and for example, only this year we had, uh, uh, we our fund supported uh, 20 documentaries, 24 feature films, 20 series that were uh, co-produced within the Nordics and a growing number also have financing from other countries. Uh, this is something we will look more into uh, through statistics, you know, what is the growing number? Because the principle has been since our fund was founded in 1990, uh, that we primarily look at Nordic co-producing productions. When we uh, uh, give support, we look at quality, uniqueness being one important factor, and at primarily the Nordic and secondarily the international distribution. But there is really a, a discussion going on with the hot global market because most projects we, we get already have much more than we demand two Nordic countries to abort, be, be aboard. But we all know the, the Nordic 12, the Nordic public service companies co-producing, and now we also have as our partners streaming services uh, which might from the be beginning distribute in five Nordic countries. And this is also when it gets more interesting to see, uh, to really check the quality, you know, what is the result, how are they marketed, how, how popular will they be in the Nordic countries, what impact will they make, because we also, of the depth of the thing, or the impact is, is, is equally important. And, and these are things that we have to consider now when it gets more and more international. So in a way, we could say it's shortly, like, Co-producing in the Nordics is self-evident. Uh, we 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 very hardly we work hard to strengthen it to keep it strength strong in tough times, but also looking at the international market. Great, and I should mention, um, you know, your fund, which is Pan Nordic and has many partners. Um, you fund not just Nordic co-productions, but also co-productions that would have a Nordic element. That would apply for the funding, but um, a Nordic company would apply for the funding, and yeah. then it could yeah. be more international as well. 
Yeah, yeah. But we 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 fund Nordic projects. So we have a, we have actually had discussions uh, with producers this very year uh, as we have started a project that I would like to mention, which goes on all 2021. It's called Audiovisual Collaboration 2021, and it is launched as a, as as a collaboration between uh, the fund. And, and the Finnish Ministry of Culture, because Finland has the presidency of, of the Nordic Council of Ministers. And the Nordic Council of Ministers is our, uh, our partner, our main partner. Upon this, we have 10 public partners and 10 private media companies. So I see that we, we are really in the mid, we can see it from so many angles as, as and also streaming services. And the idea with audiovisual collaboration, which will start it was launched in Gothenburg at the film festival, uh, 15th of March, it will arrange a dialogue between the Nordic industry and EU on upcoming uh, legislation and, 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 and directives and see, you know, what is the Nordic view on this? And, and what is changing in Europe. So of course, what we do strategically all also should benefit the whole European market. And, and by the way, this you should check our website and I know you can put out the links after yeah. this discussion because uh, so everybody can join the 15th March session. And then we will we'll, we'll also have uh, sessions at, at CPH Docs at, at the Norwegian International Film Festival in Haugesund, that's Finnish Film Affair in Helsinki, et cetera. And the whole idea is to build bridges between uh, the industry and the decision makers, and to look at the the three the vision 2030 from from the uh, minister uh, the council of minister, which is very much what the film industry is looking to diversity, of course, sustainability, and compatibility. So these are things that we are working on on a new level with this this year, and and as part of this, when we launched it in Gothenburg. We, we actually also asked non-Nordic producers, how is it to co-produce with the Nordics? And it was funny because there was a lot of praise and, and among others that everybody speaks English, that's wonderful. Everybody is very into the, the ment mentality is right. Everybody is very into co-producing and there are so great system for us to co-produce within the Nordics and, and, and so on, uh, uh, not to mention the talent. But as this British producer said, but then you have so strong internal core production systems. So how will you open them up? Because when, when you come from another outside the Nordics, you are easily asked, uh, well, I suppose you have all the Nordics aboard, aboard your project. Because in the Nordics, we are so used to have a lot of countries aboard, but there is not yet the function of co-producing as a joint venture, because every commissioner sees the project from a national sphere. And this was uh, one of the questions raised uh, during our launch session of audiovisual collaboration 2021. And actually uh, it was discussed on a ministry level after that, you know, that the Eastern yeah. possibility should we in the Nordics actually work more actively uh, as the ministry representative, Laura Mackela said, to, to we should look into this question. So the discussion will continue and audiovisual collaboration is a project that one question is raised in one place it's developed and deepened and, and, and we get more nuances in the next session somewhere else in the Nordics. So please post the link. We will yes, uh, my colleague Emma is going to put a link to that in the chat and also to a very helpful document um, co-producing with the Nordics. The, the, this comes out every year. There's a new edition for 2021. We'll put that link in the chat as well. Lizla, do you want to say what that is? Yeah, I, 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 I'd love to because I think uh, we can't support i mean we can't uh, uh, applications that are coming outside the nordics from from companies outside the nordics uh, it's not possible for us to financially support them but we support strategically a, a, a stronger co-production and that is why we, we yearly publish and update this very important uh, info package so please check that link you can take there are all the funding systems very clearly explained in all the Nordic countries in English. So everybody who wants to co-produce in the Nordics, you will find a lot of practical information there. And, yeah, and I think anybody who's tuned in to this webinar, that is going to be the perfect document for you because, you know, obviously there are the five film institutes which can work for some co-production funding um, in certain circumstances. There's also regional funders like Film Vast. Yeah. Um, 
you know, many more. So check out that booklet. Can I just link is there. That, uh, if you don't want to wait to find a link later, you just go to our homepage and then you put in the search uh, co-production and you will find a lot of other articles and useful information of co-producing within the Nordics and with the Nordics. Perfect. Thank you. I think Emma just put that link in the chat for everybody who's curious to see it. And next up, we have one of those people who might have an opinion or like, are the Nordics closed off to the rest of the world or not? I hope he's going to say they're not. Um, I'd like to bring on Mike Goodridge, who is founder of the new UK production company, Good Chaos. And hello. hello. And Mike's uh, an industry veteran. Even though he looks so young, he's still a veteran. Um, he used to be the CEO of Protagonist Pictures. He also used to be my boss at Screen International. Um, but Mike is uh, the UK co-producer for Ruben Ostlund's forthcoming, hotly anticipated film, Triangle of Sadness. Um, Mike, I know you worked with Philippe Bobert, who's one of the producers alongside Eric Hemmendorf, um, to get the UK involved. Can you tell us a bit about how that was getting the UK into this film? Because it wasn't shot in the UK. Yeah, I guess I mean, Harris I, I, is, is British, but not yeah. a lot of UK elements. You wanted to find out if I thought Nordics were closed off. Because, um, of course, traditionally the UK has been closed off um, in terms of European co-production. So that's always been something on the back of my mind. Um, and when I started talking to Philippe about Triangle of Sadness, which obviously is, is made by this, you know, super world-class Palme d'Or winning filmmaker. I thought it was worth a shot sort of talking to the UK um, public funds. The film is in English. Um, it's Ruben's first film in English. It's, um, it stars um, Harris Dickinson, who is the lead actor in the film and he's an English actor. Um, and of course, it's not, you know, it's set all around Europe. Um, so it's not, you know, set in, in Gothenburg. It's not a Swedish film. It's it's a sort of pan-European film. So uh, why wouldn't the UK be interested in this film? And, and, you know, it was proved to be the case. So I was really encouraged by that. And you uh, were able to bring on uh, BFI funding and BBC Films. How easy or hard was that? Well, um, they were both very enthusiastic. Um, I, was, I was, you know, delighted that they saw the the value of being involved in something which which to be honest is a massive european co-production i mean the the thing that i've always admired about philippe is that he's a he's a great creative producer but he's also you know he's he builds these financial structures which are which are so complex you know and and brilliant um and this is german it's france it's sweden it's denmark and uk um and has many participants and it's a, it's not a low budget film yeah, and on a film of that size, or maybe just with a film with an auteur like this, how involved do you personally get creatively or logistically? You know, are you on calls with all these partners? Do you give notes to Ruben? Are you allowed? <laughs> oh, sure, because I'm sure he'd love to hear my notes. Not terribly, <laughs> actually, on this. You know, I am. I, I do look at myself as a very creative producer, but on this film, it was specifically about getting the UK involved on the financial side. I mean, you know, <laughs> Ruben doesn't need much help in coming up with an amazing screenplay and nor frankly when he's directing so I think you know he's got his regular partners in in Eric and Philippe who who work with him um, and but this was such a big production that that there were a lot of other co-producers involved. Yeah and you know even with something like Harris Dickinson because you're in the UK do you help you know, any communications with his agent or anything of that level, or that's done outside of you? No, it was, he was cast before I came on, I think, actually. Um, he was one, he's, it's obviously a key role in the film, so he was cast early on. Um, I'll tell you what is interesting about, about the UK is our legal system and our legal closings on the film, which no doubt you've Interesting, yes. Um, and once again, and I've come across this several times before, the, 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 the melding the UK legal requirements with continental Europe, and actually we have a US partner in this too, was quite a challenge, you know, and the legal fees started racking up and the, you know, the time started passing when we needed to close this finance. And 
of course, because of COVID, it, <laughs> there were multiple closings. So um, it was complicated. I mean, it is a, an ongoing issue, the, the Anglo system versus the Euro system. Yeah, and has can I drop the B-bomb? Um, is Brexit going to make that even harder? I don't know yet. Um, I suspect not. I mean, I, I've heard rumblings that the BFI is coming up with a new um, co-finance, co-production strategy. And I think, you know, rather than the complacency that I think the UK in general has had before in terms of co-production, Brexit might be, might be the opportunity we need to kind of make ourselves more, um, more aggressive in terms of working with not just Europe, but the rest of the world. And so, you know, I hear nothing but exciting things coming out of the BBC, the BBC, the BFI um, and the BBC. And the BBC, um, they're both very international looking. Yeah, and film days. four is too, you know, our public funds tend to, tend to look outside of the borders. You know, we make films set in America made by British directors. We make um, films, by people like Sasha Pollock or Jessica Hausner that are in English. You know, I think we're quite open. You know, I think we're not, um, because English is, is a world language, I think we're open to, um, to films that aren't necessarily, you know, fitting into a rigid British box. Yeah. And Mike, just because I know you, um, I bet if we sort of look at your bookshelves, there's some like Camilla Lackberg novels <laughs> back there. I know you're a big fan of Scandinavia and yeah. the Nordics. Um, yeah. Do you hope to do more co-production? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, I've always, I've always believed from, from my childhood obsession with Bergman on that, that <laughs> there's something special about Scandinavian storytelling. And it's not just auteurs like Bergman or Rubin or Jan Trell or, or these master filmmakers that I've followed all my life. It's, it's, it's comedy. It's, um, it's it's obviously the the thriller genre has become associated with the Nordic countries. I think the storytelling is is pretty outstanding in general and sort of punches above the weight of the populations of those countries. And I want to be a part of that. You know, um, I'm working um, with a with a Finnish filmmaker, Jalmari Halanda, and his producer Petri Jokiranta on on a couple of films. Actually, I'm working in Iceland with Hadi Sigurdsson and. Um, Grima Jonsson on a feature film in English. Um, so as much as I can do in Scandinavia, I will. I mean, I, I you know, I'm, I, I love the voice of Scandinavian filmmakers. Yeah, really great to hear. Thank you, Mike. Um, I'm gonna, speaking of the Scandinavian voice and just amazing films, I'm gonna next bring on Monica Hellstrom, who is a producer at Final Cut For Real, which is a great company in Denmark. And Monica, is white hot right now because of Flea. And I'm sure some of our audience here has been reading about Sundance or was attending Sundance. And obviously one of the hot breakout titles at Sundance was Flea. So um, Monica, if I can get you to turn on the camera, there we go. And your mic's hopefully on. Yeah. You know, congrats on Flea, just an amazing piece of creative storytelling that I know has been at work for many years. Can you tell us how the film was set up? Because it is a co-production. Yeah, so the film started as a, a, a film that was based on a documentary. So the director was uh, recording like documentary parts and then we, we had animation parts in between every time the character told about stories that previously happened. So we uh, contacted an animation company in Denmark, uh, and then it was very clear that working with animation, it's, it's not cheap. So uh, luckily the animation company in Denmark had a very strong link uh, to France. So we approached a company that they had worked with previously uh, and, and set up like the full animation team with the, between Denmark and France, uh, and that worked out. So, it kind of slowly built up. Um, and then I had met Adi Ave, actually, um, a, a producer from, uh, from Sweden that I had previously worked on with uh, on another film. And she came on board as the Nordic, as the Swedish co-producer. Uh, I had, um, and then we had, we worked with the Mere film in Norway. So we kind of built it up. So it became like a Danish, Fra French, uh, yeah, Swedish, 
we're making co-production, so massive. We have five partners. But what I think is really beautiful about like co-productions is that when you start working together over many years and with uh, within the different countries in the Nordics and also abroad, of course, you start getting to know like creative um, talents. Like, so I, for example, have like a composer that I've worked with on many films from Sweden. And I think I will even choose to work with him even, even if it's not a Swedish um, uh, co-production. So you sort of, build up a, a team of creative talents across the country that can really help like up your film. Uh, yeah, did that answer the question? <laughs> yeah, that did, thank you. Um, and you mentioned Iava, which is a great place to, to find uh, partners. I mean, how how else did you, had you known Marifilm, um, Maria and her team before? Or, you know, how do you go to co-production markets? How do you meet all these, the right people? Yeah, I think with Mia Film, I really want, I really love the films that they're doing, and they're also doing fictions, fiction films, and, and Fine Cut Real, we started as a documentary, pure documentary company, and they've started co-producing fiction films as well, and I think also it's nice to look at partners on, you know, who can help you um, get into different fields or get different experiences on board that you may not yet have, and I really admire what Mia Film had done. So yeah, yeah. and also we uh, we worked with Eskil Vakt, uh, oh, yeah. right? He was a consultant on the film, and he had a film with Mia Film. So it kind of made sense to to go with them in Norway. Wow, that's I didn't know Eskil was involved. That's really cool. Um, and how do how did those partners contribute? Not just by tapping into maybe finance in other places, but the creatively. You mentioned. Sort of loosely that yeah the film became stronger by having sort of different voices i guess how do you manage you know creativity that they can bring in versus protecting jonas's vision mm. yeah how do you do that I, I think you need to choose your partners in a real good way and i think of course the film was developed out of Denmark, so in that way, uh, the vision was protected as in we spent a long time sort of shaping the film before people came on board. Uh, but then I think it was amazing to get get people's view on the film, and I think that can really help also to strengthen the project, so it doesn't just become a Danish, you know, point of view and a Danish story, but you know, so you have French eyes on, on, on the film that can give a different perspective and can really uh, uh, sort of enrich the, the the film and the envision. So I think there's a balance of like protecting the the director from all the inputs, but but also taking things into to make it richer for sure. Yeah, and if I can ask a sort of more um, boring question, um, when you go to the Danish Film Institute um, for funding. Does it, is it the sort of same pot of money if you're making sort of a, a Danish Swedish co-production or is it a different pot of money once France is involved and that kind of thing? Or are they just there to support a project no matter? I think they're there to support a project, but I think for, for sure, because uh, we are very lucky that when we started the film and we knew it was gonna be all uh, animation, that was the decision we made at one point. And then Art de France became interested and were interested in co-producing the film and I think that really helped uh, us going back to the Danish Film Institute and for the Danish Film Institute to understand that, okay, this was like a bigger film than the normal documentary films that we do. Like the, the budget is five, six times the size of a no normal documentary film. Uh, so I think that really helped them understand the, 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 the value of or the, how big the project could be. And, and also in terms of then, supporting it in a bigger way than, than a smaller documentary film. Yeah, I think that's really great to help understand the ambition too, yeah, yeah. that it's but not just going to be a film for the Nordics. Yeah. But that's it. I think it doesn't matter for them if it's a French or a Swedish partner you come with. Like, I think they always look at the project and, and the ambition of the project. Great. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to... Uh, say goodbye temporarily to Monica and bring in um, our next producer guest, who is Gudni Hummelvoll, who's producer at Hummel Film in Norway and president of the European Producers Club in Norway. Welcome, Gudni. Thank you. 
Thank you for being here. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about some of the co-productions you've worked on through your company and how did you find the right partners? Hmm. I think I think almost all of the features we've done has all been co-produced uh, in the Nordic, except for the last one where I actually have a Lithuanian co-producer. But um, most of it I have found it through either other colleagues and then you met and they sort of became your partners, even if I've had different uh, co-producers, but the, most of them I've done, you know, at least three, four, some five projects with, because I find, I think that when you find, or when you co-produce, it's like a marriage. You sort of really need to find somebody you trust and also somebody who sort of have your vision and understand the project. And of course, from for that, that you might go with uh, different um, type of producers, but um, usually I've sort of, um, at least for the last few ones, we've sort of stayed with the same one. At least you introduce a project and say, is that something that's interesting for you? And if they don't have time or if they don't find it, look for it. So within the Nordic, no, I never sort of found them uh, at the co-production market, but I have met, you know, other European producers that um, we have tried to put up projects and also uh, through, you know, Norway has something called uh, Sørfond, which is sort of a top financing for uh, countries, you know, the DAP countries. Uh, there I've met people in co-production market that have sort of approached me or through other friends have said, I have a great uh, project. Um, yeah, so, but uh, it's uh, it most, you know, I've done co-productions that are, just the three countries or with, you know, uh, with another European country. But I, I, I would like to address that, you know, even if, you know, what's good about the Nordic system that everybody has said is that, you know, um, the rule sort of fits. It doesn't always fit the right, you know, when uh, application deadlines, when we want also to go to your remarks, but the, uh, and you, it's easy to exchange creativity and it's uh, um, and it also sort of helped the finance and as a producer with when you get all the sort of local you know Nordic funding you also get to keep your rights much more than and um, it sort of helps it financing you don't have to run up all the legal um, bills like Mike was talking about uh, and um, the system sort of makes it that you don't have to have some so much um, you know equity financing in the same place but I think still one of the things that we need to work on is that everybody thinks of the Nordic as one market and uh, we're not uh, yeah. it's still really hard to have a Norwegian film seen by the Swedes especially the Swedes if you want, like a big big you know name uh, and uh, we all have to work on uh, with uh, all the Nordic, with the Finns and the Icelandic. And in that sense, I think if I can just switch over to the uh, television, the Nordic 12 that I started, the public company, actually sort of helped that we start to watch each other's uh, programs. And hopefully that would also spill over to, uh, to, uh, to films or to movies, because now then you get used to see you know, a Finnish a TV series or Icelandic or then a Swedish and or hopefully the Swedes and the Danes will watch some of the Norwegians. So uh, we still have a way to go there. But also when you co-produce either with the Nordics or another country, you have a producer who will, would like to help you to get into the, you know, uh, a different market. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to ask about the TV world. Does Does that feel like it's more open to co-producing in general because you tend to get lots of broadcasters on board I think the beginning uh, um, yes and no uh I think uh, it feels right now <laughs> sitting and trying to find them some of the uh, or green light some of the shows that uh it's a little bit harder to find European broadcaster right now but I think um they're more open somehow and uh, uh, they found, at least for the Nordic, with the Nordic Noir, they found some uh, genres with, uh, especially it's been popular in Germany or 
uh, I co-produced with France and Belgium uh, on TV shows because there was topics that were interesting. So um, yes and no, but I think it floats a little bit um, easier. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Goodney. We'll um, bring you back out in a second, but I'd like to now um, turn to Rina Sildos, who is a founder and producer of Amrian Productions in Estonia. And Rina is the Estonian co-producer of uh, Compartment Number no. 6, which is from the Finnish director Juho Kusamanen, who we know from Olimaki. Um, can you tell us how, how you got involved in the film and how Estonia is involved? Uh, well, hello to everybody. Um, it's a, it's a quite an interesting story because it started in 2014 in the training program where I was working like an expert. And Juho was introducing uh, his uh, project named Boxer, which came out like a happiest day in early Maggie's life. And in his financing plan, I saw the name of my company, not knowing the project yet. <laughs> So uh, I was amazed, but when I read the project, I really liked it. So I wanted to co-produce the project, the first project of Juha Korsman and already then, but it was, um, uh, let's say, difficult times in uh, financing in Estonia because it's a small country and, uh, and it's quite limited public financing. So we started to talk about uh, possible another project. And then uh, I had in mind uh, a novel by Rosa Lixum, which was also translated in... Uh, uh, to Estonian and, and Finnish language and English, and it was a award-winning novel. And we started to develop it ourselves in Estonia with the scriptwriters. Uh, and it was a wonderful journey because uh, we worked together with Johan uh, writing the script and uh, developing uh, the other aspects of the film because uh, it uh, all the action takes place uh, in uh, Russia. Yes. So uh, my part uh, was also uh, bringing uh, the partners from Russia and I have also quite, quite an experience uh, with working with Russian producers. So we set up a co-production between Estonia, Finland, uh, Russia and Germany. And uh, we shot the film uh, last year. And now uh, I could say that we have uh, a master in coming days. So we were very, very happy to work together on, on, on that film. Uh, but otherwise, Estonia is a small country and uh, and uh, been in the business for over 20 years. And it means that if you want to make more ambitious projects, you just have to co-produce. Hmm. So I've co-produced um, probably with 15 different countries. And uh, of course, our partners, the usual suspects are Finnish uh, production companies because we are very near our mentalities. Uh, is quite similar and we know very well each other's talent. So we have we worked quite a lot together. And I've been always, you know, kind of monitoring the other Nordic countries and uh, thought about that um, they are co-producing within the, the Scandinavian countries. Uh, and because, of course, I mean, the public funding is stable, the system uh, works, and they're very comfortable within the, this kind of uh, producing um, model. But I'm very, very happy that um, I think the, the new tendency, like maybe it happened also with the development of TV series, it really has drastically changed. And there are there is talent, uh, which has really a global appeal. And that's why also there are more and more projects uh, that are uh, interested to find um, financing from other countries. And there are more and more co-productions coming on board with the other uh, either European or even non-European countries. So it's a new tendency, which I very much appreciate. Yeah, and how did it work on Compartment 6? Um, had you ever worked with a Russian co-production before and a German? And how, did those systems kind of work together okay? Um, Yes, but it's it's always up to the producers also, if I can say so, yeah. because uh, we are creative. We have to reinvent ourselves all the time. We have to find ways. So yes, I have co-produced before uh, with Russia also, so I know the system very well, and uh, and it works out really brilliantly. I I, I there, you have to just know, uh, for example, how the public bodies work, uh, what they require uh, beforehand, everything you know, of course, and uh, when you set up your strategy, and um, then it just works out. So it's not a problem. I mean. Uh, from Germany also we had ZF on board and and uh, and other regional funds so uh, it all worked out really really very well we were hit by by COVID and it was uh, at the beginning of March last year and it was 
only the beginning. Nobody knew anything. So th that was the time we were a little bit terrified because uh, we still had to shoot like 10 days in Russia. And we had to move uh, from Murbansk, which is very far north, uh, to Moscow. But it was obvious that uh, in Moscow already the numbers went uh, so rapidly up. And uh, to go back, you know, to shoot something uh, in, in, in Russia would be really, really, let's say, impossible. And uh, so we, we uh, relocated uh, the uh, production near St. Petersburg. We were able to do the hotel scene in a, a remote hotel. There were no other people. So we asked the team. They said, yes, we made the shooting. And then we kind of smuggled our creative crews back, going by foot over the border. So luckily, uh, we made it. And uh, yeah. And we didn't have to go back even. We had in, um, in mind uh, two days of shooting uh, exterior, uh, exteriors in Moscow, but luckily in the editing room, uh, we saw that we don't need it. So, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, I was actually supposed to go visit the set during those final 10 days and yeah, had to cancel. I was not seen as essential to, to go to Moscow that week, um, but it's really amazing you got to finish the shooting before COVID. Um, yeah, I actually wanted to bring up COVID. I'd like to invite the whole group to come turn on your cameras, turn on your mics, and let's have a bit of a group discussion um, because we know the pandemic, um, this is not a panel about shooting in the pandemic, don't worry. But we know the pandemic has made production harder for very obvious reasons. But could does anybody want to talk about has it made co-production harder? Um, because, you know, borders have physically closed, some of them, you know, and some places like I know Germany, you know, there's funds that only Germans can access for, you know, if you're a freelance cinematographer, maybe you can get some funding in Germany to keep you going. But maybe if you're working on a, UK production, you don't have the same kind of funding. Um, has anybody had experience of, maybe Mike, I mean, has I know that the production was complicated by COVID and you also finished shooting, so congrats, but what about the co-production aspect? Well, it was actually kind of um, great in a sense because, you know, we were presented with these incredible challenges and all the co-production countries stepped up and helped us um, financially, and supportively to, to overcome them. You know, I mean, it, you know, there was a, a budget impact, quite a considerable one, actually. I mean, we, we shot in three blocks over 11 months. Um, so it was, it was very complicated, but, but all the funds and all the, the, the participants were incredibly supportive. And that included BBC Films and BFI in the UK who were really supportive. I mean, I, I think it, it sort of brought out the best in everybody, if you know what I mean, because we wanted to get this film made. Um, Liz, a lot. Did you want to chime in? And yeah, then because we, we just we are just uh, publishing in a in a week or so or this spring anyway, uh, in March anyway, uh, uh, a new survey on the impacts on the pandemic on the Nordic industry, and and we have looked at it from 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 schedules, from economic, but also from content. And during the, this research, which is is look, looking deeply uh, to to some projects and, and uh, in all in all to 155 Nordic projects. The result shows that uh, the budget raise due to the COVID has been between nine to 12 percentage, but there is also changes in content. So there are content changes in 55 percentage of the series and in 29 percentage of the films. It, and then we look deeper, you know, how is it artistic compromises or what, but, but there is a big change, but the main result you know, and thought that, that comes from this long research is the resilience of the industry. So I also really want to thank the whole tough industry. It's a tough industry from before, but, but fighting like hell to survive. Yeah. And Goodney, did you have an experience during COVID? Yes, I did with um, uh, my film that we had to have, um, we had the several COVID stops, unfortunately, but we, um, you know, uh, this was a major Norwegian production and we got some help from the Norwegian Film Institute. But I think for, uh, I was going to say Mike was very lucky because I find that a lot of, um, at least when I talk to my other European colleagues, most fundings will not support minority uh, productions. You know, they, they will help, especially in film that, you know, even in Norway, you know, you can't apply for 
COVID support if you are a minority production. And we have, I'm right now, we have a, I'm doing a Swedish co-production and because the border has been closed. So the, the Swedish and the, uh, and the, um, the Swedish director and the Norwegian editor has not met physically at all ever. So, and of course that sort of, it works because of technology, but it sort of takes longer time and all that. So, but it, it's a good thing. Um, I think that will also will be a challenge for a lot of people when, you know, um, even if most of the institutes have help uh, working, you know, trying to find ways to do that. But I think perhaps on the European level, we should find a way to um, apply for support when we, you know, if, and hopefully it will end at some time and this situation will continue because it's going to be difficult and especially I see with my Norwegian colleagues that have to rechange everything because they were supposed to shoot in another country and can't go. Yeah, Lizela, did you want to I say something? Very shortly that, that, that the research I mentioned is, is primarily looking into the mitigation. How did they actually help the industry, what sort of mit mitigation helped and what did not. And, and those especially de designed for the industry, of course, helped better, but there is there is a lot to, to still research and we will continue to see, you know, and, and all, that's why this is, I, I just want to thank, thank you, Gudni, for this comment also, that all these should be put in the same castle to see what also the funding systems and the governments could do mm. to support productions. Yeah, Reina. Uh, well, I wanted to uh, tell my own experience with the uh, six country co-production I'm doing. It's a, a family fantasy film. And uh, we were shooting also last year, we were supposed to shoot in Lithuania, Ukraine, but then we had to postpone the shooting and shoot in Estonia, here building up huge sets, et cetera, et cetera, and Luxembourg. And the shooting, uh, I have to say, uh, we could make very safely. And uh, it was, you know, of course, over cost coming with uh, all the COVID restrictions, et cetera, et cetera. But it was difficult because um, there still was something, you know, in the air that people were feeling very insecure. And we had a very, very good sound designer from Lithuania. Uh, over 60 years old and it, he just said that he can't uh, work with the mask and it was understandable he feels uncomfortable and there were some other positions that we had to change you know uh, already you know shooting uh, going into the second shooting period uh, we managed that but for um, my surprise we have a post-production going on now in four countries and it really is very difficult for a director to work, uh, you know, online in editing, in sound, working with a composer. Also, have a lot of VFX uh, effects. So, uh, I could really say that uh, the budget goes up like with twenty percent on post production, and time wise, also you have to count on more and more months which, you know, uh, postpones the delivery, but from the other side, the cinemas are shut anyway. So a lot of questions that are still like open and in the air, but luckily, of course, we had some support also from our government side and also in some countries of co-production. So it eased, uh, but I, I, I could say that uh, producing now uh, with really like um, more than three, four countries is a real challenge and experience. Yeah, I take my hat off to anybody who can produce, much less co-produce, much less during a pandemic. So well done. Um, we're getting some great audience questions in, so I wanted to get to a few. Um, this one was Reham Isoldines, and I think it's so timely. Um, how do you set up a co-production and still leave the financing methods open to including a platform coming in? I mean, there was a great article, I think it was in The Hollywood Reporter yesterday about, you know, the disarray that doing a platform deal can bring in. Um, has anybody had experience of that or is that, um, is that something you think about when you structure these deals? Monica, do you have experience or? Yeah, I think, and I think it's <clears throat> maybe a little bit different from fiction and documentaries because documentaries, we, we tend to apply for Creative Europe TV programming. So we already, while, while financing and production, we get all these TV, <clears throat> we sell a lot of territories on. Uh, so that becomes very complicated in terms, terms of like getting a big platform on board. It, yeah, 
So uh, yeah, so that's something that we definitely look into, and and and. But I think, it, as I understand it, they become more open for like taking some territories and not all of them, because of course that becomes very complicated when you have sold certain countries already. Yeah, Mike, I know you're setting up so many projects. Is this something you're thinking about on a daily basis of how to set things up that leaves the possibility of a platform deal? Yeah, I mean, I used to be a sales agent and and you know it was at the beginning when netflix and amazon were starting to be really active in the in the acquisitions business and actually that's partly why i left being a sales agent because i wanted to sort of step back a bit and be at the stage where i could decide which financing model i was going to pursue rather than be in the in, independent the classic international sales model which um which you know, is struggling at the moment because these platforms are disrupting, they're disruptors, you know. Um, so um, I tend to look quite holistically at the beginning of the process. Um, I, I talk to platforms early on, and if they're not interested in say, come back when you've got it made, then I know the avenue I have to go down. You know, I think it's when they start getting involved um, later on in the process that sales agents get into a muddle because of course the independent distributors have, have essentially got the film made and then they're told they can't have the film anymore because a platform wants it. Yeah. Um, I mean, this happened on a uh, trial of the Chicago seven this year and also Coda, yeah. I think was the article. Um, I mean, that I it happened with, with, me with one film where we had pre-sold a bunch of territories and then Netflix came in with a, with an astonishing offer. And we had to, um, fortunately we'd only sold a, a, a few territories, but we had to go to the distributors and, and sort of beg them <laughs> beg them to understand the producer's um, necessity to get this film made. Um, so it's it's awkward. And now I think it's becoming a quite a severe problem. Mm. Yeah, Goodney, did you want to say something there? No, yeah, I, you know, um, as a, you know, a European independent producer, I think it's really important that we sort of uh, try to stick to our co-production schemes and, and stay, um, you know, in demand and, or, you know, that we decide the, uh, our content. And also because if we do co-production or by ourselves, I think we can have a much um, more understanding of each other's language and the cultures, and it will be a more diverse European film industry. But that said, of course, it's also, I know, um, we have had, um, especially TV shows that have been sold to a streamer uh, after it's gone through Europe, and which is great. And, you know, some of my colleagues only have, you know, they know they have a film that will probably never sell in France or Germany. So they have the Nordic market and the streamer takes the rest. So there are very many different models and some are, of course, uh, great and some, like say, can be worse. But I think it's uh, important that we as European creative producers sort of try to stick stick together and stand your ground a bit yeah more diverse uh, european and especially now when we can't travel we need to work together to see each other content and um, you know can long to go to italy or you know eat something nice in paris you know so um but it, it's i think a mixture is good but i think we need to work how to be more compatible with the European co-production, um, production, especially when the COVID goes away. And uh, so we can, you know, uh, keep this, the voice of the European um, um, cinema. Great. Um, we're getting a couple of questions that I think sort of fit together. You know, we've got somebody from Egypt, we've got somebody from the Philippines, we've got somebody from Latin America saying, you know, we've talked mostly about European co-productions and are the Nordics open to co-producing with other regions, other countries, and I know they are. So um, does anybody have a view on that and how good name? I just want to say very briefly, um, um, and then um, Monica uh, can say something else. Of course, for feature films, it's uh, I think it's coming from a Norwegian standpoint, if you want to go through the normal change, um, you know, the normal uh, routes of going into applying for the film institute, it's quite hard sometimes from some countries because we have a very sort of strong um, point system. It's expensive in Norway. It's sometimes hard to do exchange or some of the creativity. 
but I have, uh, you know, we, I've co-produced with um, um, uh, Argentina and also South Africa through uh, the third fund or the South Fund and where it's easier to come in. I know, and I know that the Norwegian farmers did have some countries that they really sort of um, want them to do, but I know that in Denmark, and of course it's different in documentaries, but that no, it's not my specialty, but I know that the Danish Film Institute has a different view and they want more international, where it's actually harder for us as Norwegian to come with, you know, um, a first time director. So, but Monica, you probably, you have, it's a different strategy and I think yeah. at the Danish Film Institute. Yeah, I think I think the Danish films too are very open for co-producing also uh, with Latin America or like the rest of the world really. But I, I think uh, as you mentioned as well, like uh, co-producing is top financing, so uh, that it can be difficult to come with a new director because it needs to be a project that you need that is pretty sure you are going to be financed and made, and that's why it can be a little bit tricky to get a, to to finance a complete new uh, director. But, and, and I just wanted to add that I think it really, it needs to make sense if you then co-produce, like we had a film taking place in Chile. So of course a co-production between Denmark and Chile made completely sense. Um, so I think we are very open for co-production from other places, but it just needs to, it needs to make sense for, for both countries to- Yeah, it can't just be a money grab in either direction. I think that's when things, really don't work. Um, thank you for saying that. And Lizla, anything to add, you know, can you work with Asia? Can- uh, uh, sure, uh, Surely, but we are not top financer. So yeah. we don't decide, you know, who, who comes aboard, but we are really, really happy to see it expand outside uh, outside Europe, also the international co-production as it, it has done a lot in TV. And, and I think uh, Goodney mentioned the Nordic 12 as in a way a model also for, for, for companies getting together to co-produce. And, and it is arranged through North Vision, which was founded in 1959. So within the TV sector, in the Nordics, we have co-produced in 59. And I think a lot of those learnings are also now in the film, film business about not, you, you all remember the horrors of Euroso. That's not what no, nobody does anymore, but, but the idea of the Nordic co-producing actually has, it has to be authentic authentic reasons that support the story uh, to make a good co-production. Monica. Yeah, I, I just said about actually working with new directors, but to be honest, I'm working with a Norwegian direct uh, producer from a Norwegian company. We produce many films together uh, and we actually have a collaboration about also, at, you know, introducing new directors and then working with, with these directors together on films so that we then co-produce. So. It's hard, but it's uh, it's possible if that's the aim of like the collaboration. So I just wanted to correct myself a little bit. Yeah, great. Um, I, we're getting lots of questions, but I I think we need to wrap up on time. Sadly, um, thank you so much, everybody, for being so engaged. And I put a few links also in the chat of the SOAR fund, um, and things like that. So take a look at some of that. Um. I wondered if you, anybody, I, I usually love to end on a positive note and I'm gonna to try to spin this, but have any of you had a disaster co-production you've learned from? Or let's say on the positive spin of that same question, what is a tip to understanding how to do a great co-production or a lesson learned or, or some kind of, yeah, advice, one piece of sort of practical advice? Monica, do you have anything? Yeah. Uh, I think what I've gained from it is that you need to have really good communication between the partners and then also be solution orientated, you know, and, and trying to understand each other's culture. Yeah. yeah. Mike, do you have a tip? Yeah, I mean, I was an, an EP on Quo Vadis Aida, the Bosnian film, um, and that had 13 co-production countries in it. Um, and was a, a, a labor of love for everybody. And I think that's what drove everybody and was was the passion, was the passion for the for telling this particular story um, and getting it made, the feeling that you were doing something more than just film. And I think it's that sort of a that mutual passion that got it made against all the odds. And and so it's just, it has to be driven by a certain a certain 
you know, desire to get it made rather than just an opportunistic way to raise money, you know? Yeah, my God, you're not doing that film to get rich, but what a beautiful piece of work. Yes. Thank, well, thank you. Um, yes, yeah. Miller did such an amazing film. Yeah, right? good knee. No, yeah, I was just going to uh, say the same because I think when you, at least when I go into a co-production, it's, I really have to like the project and of course have the partners that I can trust and, and also think that I can actually, even if I'm not you know, somehow contribute, not that I'm gonna mess always with the creative, but because you never really, you know, you don't get rich, especially not in the Nordics of doing a co-production. You do it because you want to help the, to make the film made. And hopefully, you know, if, uh, uh, because as I said, it's hard to get the other film, um, uh, to get it to work very well in, on, in the cinema. So, but yeah, passion and passion, uh, passion Re and, uh, knowing and liking the ones you work with. Yeah, and Rena, what about your tip? Well, um, I think that even a disastrous um, a production is a, is an experience, a good experience, and you learn from that. Uh, but what I would like to emphasize is uh, trust your gut feeling, really. And the other thing is do your homework. If these two things fall into places, and if you have questions in your head, always ask them in, uh, out loud in voice and get the answers. So then you will be safe. <laughs> okay, ask the questions. Yeah, don't be silent. And Lizalot, do you have any, any tip? I'm happy this ended at such positive notice. And I totally support, trust your intuition, but do the homework research and intuition and love for the project. It, it shows also in the applications we get. Yeah. The partners love for the project. That's that's wonderful. That's all great advice. See, it was kind of ending on a happy note. Thank you so much to all our speakers for sharing your experience. So honestly, um, I wanted to mention we have two more webinars this week, same time tomorrow for youth films, same time Thursday for sales demystified. Um, you can sign up for those at scandinavianfilms.org if you haven't already. I think all these videos will be reposted on YouTube eventually, or just stay tuned um, if you miss part of today or you miss one of the other ones this week. And if you would like to have a drink with all these uh, amazing Scandinavian partners, maybe you can have a drink and convince somebody to be your co-producer. There is a Scandinavian Films happy hour of course, that is online. You don't even really have to have a drink if you, you don't want. Um, that's from five to seven CET tonight on Wonder. And I'm putting a link in the chat if anybody wants to join that. I, you know, it's, it's great to see so many people engaged. We didn't quite get to all of the questions. So I wanted to say we will um, copy and paste those and try to get the five film institutes to respond to those questions separately. So we really do appreciate that you were so engaged. Stay well, everybody, stay creative, stay collaborative and see you again tomorrow. Not you speakers, you don't have to come back tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.